All right. Well, we both made it in. So shall we get started then, Cleet? <laughs> yes, let's do it. All righty. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Gratton, and I'm a shareholder at the Coley Jessen Law Firm located at One Pacific Place here in Omaha. My practice focuses exclusively on immigration law and specifically employment-based immigration law. Presenting with me today is Cleet Sampson, who is a partner at the QTAC Rock Law Firm in downtown Omaha. Cleet's practice also focuses on employment-based immigration as well as commercial litigation. Today, we will be presenting on what employers need to know about H-1B sponsorship, as well as COVID-related impacts to the United States immigration system. I'd like to start the presentation by asking if you have ever found yourself needing to hire for a hard to fill position or any position for that matter, and no one in the applicant pool had quite the right credentials. Have you ever considered widening the applicant pool to include skilled foreign nationals? The H-1B visa was first introduced under President H.W. Bush in the Immigration Act of 1990 to address this exact dilemma. Many tech companies were experiencing a shortage of technology skills in the workforce, and the H-1B was created to allow foreign nationals who possess the right credentials to work lawfully in the United States. Today, large and small tech companies alike sponsor foreign workers on the H-1B visa. In fact, some of the top tech companies in the U.S file more than 10,000 new and extension requests every year. The H-1B uh, visa is not limited to the tech industry though. Over the past decade, eight companies that are currently trying to develop a coronavirus vaccine received approvals for more than 3,000 biochemists, biophysicists, chemists, and other scientists through the H-1B program. So let's talk about what a company needs to know about the H-1B program. I'm going to first cover the substantive eligibility requirements for this visa category, and then I'll get into the procedure involved in requesting an H-1B visa, which is equally important. Cleet will then finish us off with a discussion of some important changes that have occurred as a result of the, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So with respect to the substantive requirements, there are four main eligibility criteria to be aware of. The first criterion is specific to the position. In order for the position to be eligible for the H-1B category, it must be a quote, specialty occupation. A specialty occupation is one in which at least a bachelor's degree in a specialized field of study is required for entry into the, pro in, into the profession. In other words, if a position requires something less than a bachelor's degree, then it's probably not an H-1B caliber position. If the position requires a bachelor's degree, but does not specify an area of study, then it's not, then it's probably not an H-1B caliber position. If the position requires a bachelor's degree in math, political science, or Spanish, then it's probably not an H-1B caliber position because the acceptable degree fields are too different. In order to be H-1B caliber, the position must require not only a bachelor's degree, but a bachelor's degree in a subset of closely related specialized fields of study. For example, something we frequently see for tech positions is, is a requirement of a bachelor's degree in computer science, software engineering, management information systems, or a related field. Now, 
since we know that a bachelor's degree in a specialized field of study is required in order for the position to be H-1B caliber, is it as simple as articulating such in the filing? We're all smart people, we can do that, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is no. That is the starting point, but in order to prevail, the government is going to review its own databases to determine if the specified degree requirement is normal to the occupation. Now these databases do not come out and definitively say yes or no. Instead, the database may say something like some positions within this occupation require a bachelor's degree, but not all. What does some mean? What does not all mean? Is it enough? And it depends. And that's something that the attorney would argue on your behalf in the filing. In the event that the government database does not make the case for you, then the government will also consider a few different things. The government will consider whether other companies in your industry normally require a specialized bachelor's degree for the same position, or whether your company specifically has always required at least a bachelor's degree in a specialized area of study to be hired into that position, or last but not least, whether your particular position is so specialized and so complex that even if others in the industry do not require a specialized degree for the position, your company must under the circumstances. Depending on the position, this analysis is sometimes straightforward, as in the case of a software engineer. But other times, it can be quite complex, which is sometimes the case for computer programmers or computer systems analysts, although we see plenty of those approvals too. Okay, the second substantive criterion is specific to the foreign national. In order for the foreign national to be eligible for the H-1B category, he or she must possess the required credentials for the position. And that makes a lot of sense. If the position requires a bachelor's degree in computer science, software engineering, or a related field, then the foreign national must possess that degree. This analysis too can be straightforward, especially where the foreign national obtained the degree here in the United States. But what about a situation where the degree was obtained abroad? Does that still work? And it depends. In certain countries, a person can obtain a bachelor's degree after only three years of education, rather than the typical four years that is required here in the US. In this situation, the foreign degree would not be equivalent to the US degree and may not be sufficient on its own. What about a situation where the foreign national doesn't have any formal education, but is incredibly qualified and has worked in the industry for, let's say, 20 years. Thankfully, the government does permit experience to be substituted for education, and there is a three-for-one rule of thumb. Three years of experience is the equivalent of one year of education. If the person without any formal education has at least 12 years of experience, then the person can qualify qualify based on experience alone in lieu of education. If the person with the three-year foreign degree also has three years of experience, then the person can qualify based on a combination of education and experience. Okay, the next one. The third criterion is specific to the employment relationship. In order for the relationship between the company and the foreign national to be eligible for the H-1B program, 
It must be an employment relationship. It cannot be an independent contractor relationship. It may be that you have a contract with a third party who supplies workers at your place of employment, and these workers are work authorized pursuant to an H-1B, but it is that third party who then petitions for the worker, not you. Okay, the fourth and final criterion is specific to the wage rate. In order to protect the wages of American workers, the government requires companies to pay the higher of what the company offers based on its internal wage system or what the government itself has determined is the prevailing wage rate for that particular occupation in that particular place of employment. This next slide here provides an example of the government's prevailing wage rate for a software developer located in the Omaha Council Bluffs MSA. The default wage source for the government is the Foreign Labor Certification Data Center Online Wage Library. This is a four level system. And in order to determine which is the applicable level for your position, you must compare your company's requirements for the position to what the government has determined is normal, okay? If the government says that a bachelor's degree is normal, but your company requires a PhD, then you'll be assigned a level three wage instead of a level one wage. If the government says requiring two years of experience is normal, but you require three years of experience, then you'll be at a level two instead of a level one. If you require a PhD plus three years of experience, where only a bachelor's and two years is normal, now you're at a level four. Now, one thing I wanna point out here, and Cleet's gonna talk more about this in a little bit, is that effective October 8th, just last month, the prevailing wage figures were abruptly increased with the aim of protecting the wages of US workers. Usually the wages reset only once a year on July 1st, and we're able to plan for those increases, but this one came unexpectedly. The political move is already being challenged in a few different lawsuits, but the new figures do remain in effect at present. And as you can see there, the increase was substantial. So what if these figures are too high? What is your company to do if these figures are too high? One option would be to look at the BLS Occupational Employment Statistics, which is a different government system that uses annual mean wages in lieu of the four-tier system. And I have that figure there for you as a point of reference. If this option still looks too high, then you could present a private wage survey for consideration, so long as it meets the government's statistical requirements. Okay, so this concludes the overview of the four main substantive eligibility requirements concerning the nature of the position, the foreign nationals credentials, the employment relationship between the company and foreign national, and the prevailing wage requirement. While each of these, uh, while each of these points are important, they are not everything it takes for approval. If you've heard anything about the H-1B visa, then you've likely heard about the H-1B lottery. The H-1B lottery is a function of there being a limited number of available new H-1B visas every year. Specifically, there are a total of 85,000 new H-1B visas every year. Demand outweighs availability, though, and so the government has implemented a lottery system for determining which requests will be processed. Under the lottery or registration system impl implemented last year, Basic information concerning the company and foreign national must be submitted in March for consideration in the lottery. The government then runs two lotteries, in fact. The first is the bachelor's or regular cap lottery, where 65,000 requests are selected. And the second is the master's cap lottery, where, where an additional 20,000 requests are selected for a total of, again, 85,000. In order to be eligible for the master's cap lottery, and thus two lotteries, um, in addition to that bachelor's cap one, 
the foreign national must have at least a master's degree obtained from a qualifying U.S. university. So it must be the U.S. university. Being selected in the lottery does not guarantee approval, but it is the first hurdle for foreign nationals seeking employment in this category. There is an important exception though. Assuming you are a for-profit company, then you are likely subject to the lottery. But note that there are certain organizations that are not subject to the lottery, and these include institutions of higher education and their related nonprofits and nonprofit or governmental research organizations. Here's some good news. Approvals are in three-year increments. So each time you are approved, it's for up to a three-year period of time. It is not a yearly filing that's required on the company's part. Also, once the foreign national has been selected in the lottery and approved, that foreign national will not again be subject to the lottery in future years. If you come across the resume of someone who is already working pursuant to an H-1B visa, chances are the person successfully made it through the lottery and you can immediately petition for a change of employer without needing to account for the lottery process. Note that there is a six year maximum in H-1B status, but there are exceptions if you have timely undertaken the permanent sponsorship process on the H-1B beneficiary's behalf. This requires filing a PERM application or Form I-140 petition by the end of the H-1B worker's fifth year in H-1B status or having an approved I-140. So no later than five years in do you want to have started that permanent sponsorship process and preferably a little sooner to ensure the availability of H-1B extensions without interruption. The government filing fees for an initial H-1B petition are set forth on the slide and the fees total $2,460.2460 if you have more than 25 employees. It's a little bit reduced if you have fewer than 25 employees. And notably, for each subsequent extension, the government filing fees are reduced. So for your first extension, three years later, the $500 fee falls off, making the filing fee $1960 if you have more than 25 employees. And for your second or subsequent extension, that $1,500 fee falls off, making the filing fee only $460. I should also mention that for just the lottery petition, there is a $10 registration fee, so that one-time fee. Note that there is an option uh, for premium processing, uh, which is to the tune of $2,500 at present, and that guarantees a government response in 15 calendar days or less. It's calendar days, not business days. Again, this one is optional, but it is a good option for companies who are wanting to uh, receive a quicker outcome on the on the matter. My last slide here shows the selection rate during the past several years lotteries. As you'll see, fewer than 50% of the lottery submissions have been selected in the past few years. But remember, this selection rate is only for new requests, not requests involving an extension or change of employer. With that, I will turn it over to Cleet, who will discuss COVID-related impacts to the U.S. immigration system. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I wanna just check, Stephanie, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, I am, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, it, and I appreciate that background um, on the, the H-1B uh, visa system and the overview. Uh, what I'd like to spend 15 minutes here discussing is uh, some of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the United States immigration system, and it, uh, including uh, including some of the policy changes that we've seen uh, since January come come from the Trump administration. Uh, since January, we've seen at least 48 separate policy changes that basically impact every facet of the United States immigration system. Some policies have been temporary in nature, while others have been uh, more of an indefinite uh, duration and continue in place today. Um, as you'll see as we go through some of these policy changes, many of them have been criticized as uh, agenda-driven restrictions. 
um, in which the pandemic has been used as, as a pretext for implementing uh, the actual uh, desired immigration objectives of the administration. Uh, today's presentation will not get into the underlying reasons or political undertones to these policy changes, but it will focus on the direct impacts that um, businesses have suffered from as a result of some of these policy changes. Uh, one other point I'd like to make is it is not unique uh, during the current crisis that countries um, employ various policy changes and immigration restrictions that are really unprecedented uh, in order to both control the amount of immigration coming into its uh, coming into its borders, as well as to control uh, outgoing immigration um, and, and basically over uh, policies that impact uh, foreign and international travel. Um, it, you know, one other thing I'd like to focus on too before we get into the actual policy changes is the, the interesting paradox between the United States immigration system and uh, draconian measures to to limit immigration and limit visas is is seen uh, by virtue of the fact that right now um, one of the leading companies toward a vaccine um, is Moderna, and Moderna was actually founded by an immigrant, um, and also uh, the current CEO of Moderna is it is an immigrant from Italy. So that just underscores the importance of the, the visa system in the United to the United States success, uh, as well as the importance of immigrants um, and the free flow of uh, talent into this country um, to support not only our businesses, but our government and, and even on a deeper level, the, the people of the United States. With that background, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we've seen um, as far as policies that have impacted international traveling. Um, the first case uh, that was identified in the United States uh, occurred on January 20th. Within 11 days of that first case in the United States, we saw that uh, the Trump administration issued a presidential proclamation that banned the entry of United States ban the entry into the United States of all travelers from the Republic of China. Um, about a, a, a month later, the, another proclamation was entered, which banned the entry of those who had been present in Iran in the prior two weeks. Um, and then shortly thereafter, probably the, the, the largest impact that we've seen to international travel was our mark was uh, President Trump's March 11th, 2020 presidential prop proclamation which suspended the entry of aliens who had been physically present in roughly 26 different European countries uh, within the preceding 14 days. Um, there, were a, there was a fourth and fifth proclamation that limited international travel into the United States from the countries of uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland and also Brazil. Uh, many restrictions continue in place on international travel both to the United States and from the United States. And in fact, many countries continue to have quarantine requirements upon entry to their countries. Um, and so if anybody who is planning on travel uh, outside of the United States to, should ensure that they check the country's uh, current status on travel. And also the United States Department of State website uh, maintains uh, travel advisories and, and instructions uh, by, by country. I want to talk a little bit about actions that have, policies and actions that have been taken which have impacted the uh, the essential immigrant and non-immigrant workers in the United States. Uh, the first thing we saw that had a direct impact was on March 17th, 2020, uh, U.S. consulates and embassies throughout the, the world were temporarily shut down and basically visa processing was halted or significantly delayed at that time. Now, USCIS did begin to reopen offices beginning in June, and most embassies and consulates are now functioning, uh, though many of the consulates and embassies will still only take emergency uh, interviews only. And the result of this delay has increased the backlog for both immigrant and non-immigrant visas and consular processing. Um, the closures and delays that we saw within USCIS also directly impacted temporary workers that were currently in the United States and their ability to obtain renewed work authorization uh, to work in the U.S. What we saw a lot of times were 
were employees that were falling out of status, um, that were falling, uh, um, losing their work authorization and not having their employment authorization documents renewed in a timely manner. Um, now, I will say USCIS issued a, a whole host of uh, temporary measures which extended uh, requirements um, for work authorization, for um, grace periods, for leaving, departing the United States and other type policies. Um, but, you know, we saw a, a dramatic impact uh, on the on the foreign born worker in the United States. Uh, you've also probably heard of, of one measure that was initially taken by the Dr Trump administration that impacted F1 visa students in which the Trump administration attempted to require F1 visa students to depart the United States if their underlying institution had went to online or remote learning only. Um, that attempt by, by the administration uh, was met with uh, numerous lawsuits that were led by um, high-level edu educational institutions such as Harvard and MIT. And essentially that pressure that came down from the, the United States educational edu uh, institutions uh, forced the Trump administration to rescind its policy. And the current policy now is to allow F1 students to remain in the United States, even if they are attending online institutions only. Uh, for those of you that, are, that, that work in HR or have a, a similar HR function, uh, USCIS and ICE did also relax the requirement for Form I-9s for workers that were uh, hired and working remotely. As you may be aware, there's a requirement that um, identity and work authorization documents be reviewed in person. Um, and during the during the pandemic, especially the, the first six months of the pandemic, uh, USCIS lessened uh, that requirement and allowed the review of documents to take place via video, Skype, FaceTime, and similar mechanisms. Um, that uh, that is an issue that I would keep an eye on because I do believe that that USCIS's regulations have lagged behind technology that's available. And you may see uh, that that requirement of, of an in-person review of, of identity documents, you may see that requirement relaxed as we move into another administration. Um, the, the, the other thing that, that I spoke about briefly was that USCIS issued various policy changes with regard to in-person interview requirements, biometric submissions, and the, basically the deadline for responding to what, what we refer to as requests for evidence. Uh, for any of you that are familiar with the visa uh, processing system, a lot of times CIS will issue a, a document called a request for evidence that requires you to submit additional evidence in, in support of your, your underlying petition. CIS did grant extensions for responding to those, uh, those RFEs as a result of the pandemic. Uh, on April 22nd, we saw perhaps the most draconian immigration uh, measure or policy change that we had experienced in 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 uh, you know tens if not hundreds of years in this country, and that was the temporarily the temporary suspension of entry into the United States of any aliens as immigrants. Um, initially, it was a sixty day suspension on legal immigration, um, and it basically applied to anybody that was outside of the country as of April twenty second. Did not have an immigrant visa that was valid as of that date nor did they have a, an official travel document. Um, th there were exceptions to that ban on entry for lawful permanent residents or green card holders. Uh, there were exceptions for uh, various aliens that were seeking to enter on immigrant visas as physicians, nurses, or healthcare professionals um, that were coming in to combat the COVID-19 virus. Um, the, the ban did not apply to those who were entering on EB-5 immigrant investor uh, visas, uh, and spouses of United States citizens, and, and so on. Um, so there were built-in exceptions to this ban, but in, but in general, this had a dramatic impact on the amount of legal immigration that we were seeing in this country. On June 22nd, 60 days later, a, a second proclamation was issued, which directly impacted um, and added additional restrictions to H-1B visas as well as L and certain J visa applicants. 
Um, the ban on this entry uh, remains in place and has been ex uh, extended through December 31st, 2020. So let, let's talk about the, the immediate impact of that uh, proclamation. Well, first of all, over the last uh, four months, it's essentially prevented hundreds of thousands of prospective immigrants and temporary workers from entering the United States to perform highly skilled and essential jobs. Uh, Stephanie spoke about uh, the standards for H-1B visas, and, and obviously the standards are, are, are high and um, relate to highly skilled and specialized knowledge. Um, this, this visa ban uh, basically impacted and, and prohibited the entry of, of those highly skilled workers. Now, there were exceptions also built into this, which, um, you know, myself and, and other uh, immigration practitioners like Stephanie and others are, are having some success in, in bringing foreign born workers over on H-1B visas. And, and I'm going to spend some time going through what those exceptions and waivers look like. For those of you interested or, or for those of you companies that may have workers that are that are stalled overseas and, and attempting to enter. Um, like I said, many consulates and embassies are now accepting um, emergency type interviews uh, and, and you, you are able to get those and we'll start talking through some of these waivers and with, in that regard. Um, first of all, you can get a waiver to this visa ban if, if you're attempting to enter as a public health or healthcare professional to alleviate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. It makes sense. We don't want to keep out doctors, nurses, or healthcare professionals that can come into the country and, and dramatically assist us in our, in our battle against this invisible enemy. Um, it, there's also exceptions for uh, travel that's supported by the United States government to meet critical U.S. foreign policy needs. Um, this fourth bubble here, that this is perhaps the one that that many that that many uh, foreign national workers with approved H-1B visas uh, may may attempt to push forward at the consulate side, um, and that's travel by technical specialists, senior level managers, and other workers whose travel is necessary to facilitate to facilitate the immediate and continued economic recovery of the United States. So let's break that down a little bit and look at what that means. So uh, consular officers may determine that an H-1B visa applicant, again, this is somebody who, who has an approved H-1B visa, who is overseas and is attempting to get the actual visa to enter the United States. This uh, employers or, or, or beneficiaries are able to show that they, they're eligible for a waiver if the employer has a continued need for the services to be, for, to be performed by the H-1B non-immigrant. Um, the applicant's proposed job duties within the petitioning company indicate that the individual will provide significant and unique contributions to meet a critical infrastructure need. Critical infrastructure is defined in this country in, in various, various ways, but keep, keep this in mind. If the H-1B applicant is coming to the United States to perform a critical infrastructure need, such as a chemical communication, defense, uh, emergency service, financial services, food and agriculture, government facility work, healthcare and public health, in information technology, nuclear reactors, transportation, or water systems. That's essentially your critical infrastructure points in the United States. The big one that we're seeing is information technology and food and agriculture. Um, the, the, we're not having really any problems getting healthcare workers in under the, the H-1B or the J program, uh, but, but information technology and food and agriculture, the, in order to get a waiver based on those critical infrastructure points, um, it takes some level of advocacy uh, with the consulate officials. Um, so, you know, again, if, if, if you or another company that you know of is having difficulty getting their H-1B visa workers back into the United States or into the United States on an initial standpoint. Um, keep in mind, the Department of State has issued uh, these waivers that are available, um, and it may take um, advocacy from an attorney or, or you know, somebody else to write a letter uh, to 
to liaison with the consular official a little bit to put the argument in front of them. Um, there are a, a few other exceptions which I'll touch on, touch on briefly. Uh, if the H-1B applicant is their education training or experience demonstrates an unusual expertise in a specialty occupation, uh, they're able to enter and, and get an exception to this visa ban. But it, again, the, the purpose of going through the, some of these policy changes today um, was, was to make people uh, aware and, and employers aware that um, not only do we have this, this pool of, of talented and skilled workers available uh, and, and the visa options are available, but now we have an extra hurdle to get over, which are these visa, which are these visa bans. Um, and um, it's doable, it's very doable. Um, but again, uh, with, with the anticipated administration change, I think what you'll see, what you're likely to see going forward is that many of these visa bans will be lifted. I think you'll start to see a little bit more of a free flow of um, visa, uh, you know, entries based on uh, non-immigrant visas such as H-1B, J visas, um, investor visas, those type of visas. I think you'll see an increase in volume um, as some of the regulations and restrictions um, are likely to go away under under a Biden administration. Um, and finally. Uh, you know, one, one other impact that, that Stephanie touched on briefly is on October 8th, um, the Department of Labor published this interim final rule, which basically changed out how it computed the level one through level four prevailing wages for occupations. Um, and, and these increases are quite dramatic. I, I, you know, I'm glad that Stephanie put on her slide that to show, you know, it's, it's roughly a 30 to $40,000 increase that is the this whole purpose of that increase is to serve as a deterrent to companies for for using the H1B programs. And again, I think you'll see some leveling out uh, of those wages over time and with the administration change. Um, in fact, I, I think you may see it actually go backwards, but just keep in mind, and I'll leave you with this quote, the, the current USCIS acting director, Ken, Ken Cuscinelli, has stated that he anticipates that the changes to the prevailing wage requirements will impact and reduce the amount of H-1B cases by about one third um, and will dramatically decrease the amount of new H-1B visa applications that are filed as part of this upcoming um, lottery in, in the early part of 2021. So uh, keep your eye on that. We'll see if, if prevailing wage um, increases are actually a deterrent to companies um, you know, in my experience, I don't think it'll be one third um, because I think, you know, most of the time companies are paying uh, well over the, the level one uh, prevailing wage for a lot of occupations. So I don't think that the I don't think this will be the deterrent that, that the administration thinks it will be. But but that remains to be seen. Um, I, I do see we have about five minutes left. That's my last slide. And I appreciate the time today. And, and Stephanie. Stephanie and I will take any questions during this last uh, three or four minutes. We do have a question <clears throat> um, and it was, do you believe additional restrictions will be placed if we go into another lockdown because of COVID? And I'm not sure, Cleet, you seem to have frozen. Oh, I did. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I I think um, you know if if the, in another lockdown situation, I do think what you'll see is probably more uh, uh, more temporary type orders that um, you know directly impact the directly impact international travel. I think that's pretty likely that you'll see that. Um, but again, I I think with the with the upcoming change in administration, um, you're more likely to, to, or I don't think you'll see as as dramatic policy changes that impact actual visa entry. Um, but I do think, you know, as a of the country as a whole, as part of any lockdown, it's going to to include a, a lockdown of international travel. That's 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 my my anticipation. 
I see I see that there's another question. So um, everybody, if um, you're here, if you want to quickly fill out the survey, I'm going to try to have Cleet and Stephanie jump off and then jump back on so they can answer. There's one question in the chat and any others if they come up. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer that that next question in the chat. How does the rule, the prevailing wage rule, affect the folks who are already on H-1B and need to file an extension? So we get this question a lot. Um, so for anyone in the H-1B, if, if you're currently on an H-1B and you're already pr approved, the increased wages do not affect your current approval. So if you're approved for another one year, two years, three years, what have you, there's going to be no change, no immediate change for you. It would only be at that moment of extension when the company goes to file that H-1B extension on your behalf. At that moment in time, there always has to be consideration of what the then current prevailing wage rate is. And so for at that moment in time, if the higher rates are in effect, then, then those will have to be taken um, into account. But as Cleet mentioned, there's going to be, a you know, if you're already on, on an approval, in the coming uh, months, there's, there's um, going to be a new president and a lot of changes, and so it, we'll just have to wait and see how that how that looks in two years' time and three years' time. You're welcome. I see. I see one more question about: uh, do, do we think uh, COVID vaccinations will be required for H-1B candidates to travel? Um, I, you know, I I think it's probably pretty likely that that they'll start to be a certificate um, that requires uh, Perfect, some sort of Tim. a negative Hopefully test. We'll get Stephanie or Cleet back on here shortly to answer these. Aaron, can you hear us? Thank you, Mr. John. Hmm. I think, uh, I, I believe our, our uh, attendees are able to hear us, Stephanie, from, from what I can see in the chat. I, I appreciate the time today. I think we're out of time. So, um, you know, obviously, uh, Stephanie and I are, are available to answer uh, any questions via the direct message function. Um, and uh, I appreciate your, your time today. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, there was a bit of a delay there for you, Aaron. Okay. And I think it, I was experiencing delays just trying to get into help. Audio um, or video? I'm still hoping um, that they might jump just back Just trying on. to connect. Hmm. I, they ended it because they said it was the end of time. Um, I think but, yeah, he was going to open it up for questions, but he froze. <laughs> uh, he never froze for me. Oh, so it's me. I mean, so, they like stopped. Yeah, they were they were still answering questions. He he went through the list himself and answered it. Oh, but right now you are frozen. You're not even moving. Okay, so it's me. Well, luckily and, this is my last one. <laughs> Yeah, and you're you're really delayed. Like you're stomping over me sometimes. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. That's okay. I I don't know if you're plugged in or using Wi-Fi. So I'm on an alternate computer. Oh well, now your audio syncing up. Yeah. It it's all Isaac's fault. He's taking all the bandwidth. Oh, that Isaac. <laughs> Alrighty. See you on the flip side, John. Kidoke doke. Bye. Bye.